usual announcements and give people a chance to settle in. So what I say is, welcome to the Keene Valley Library, wherever you are. Wherever <laughs> Uh, it's a special hey, Jim. and we're trying very hard to keep up with all our programming and actually we've expanded now. And the summer lectures have, have been as long as I've known, uh, as long as I've known the library, I've been part of the library's tradition. So this year we decided that we would not cancel them even though the library is closed. And on to way of doing this. Um, David Craig is our Zoom master and has been just tweaking it every week so it gets a little better. It's sometimes hard to find the link. I will tell you that it's on the Keene Valley Library webpage under events, and it's called the Summer Lecture. I think it's called the Summer Lecture Series. And you can look there, click on it, and in there, not only will there be a link to, to the lecture, lecture that's live, but there will also be a link to the past lectures where you can view the ones that have gone before. So I tell you that and you can pass the word as best you can. Um, so with saying that, I will tell you that we're doing two art programs uh, this week. One is for children ages four to eight. The other one is for children uh, eight to adulthood. And we're altering books um, for this summer in that older group. Um, it's kind of fun. Anybody can join. It's all done via Zoom. Uh, all right, so um, stand by. Bear with me a second. Okay. Okay. Am I so I'm unmuted? Yes, you are. Great. So I'm Alexi Worth, and I'm going to share my screen so that we can begin to look at um, paintings of Frank's. And let's just see. And make sure you can unmute Frank. Yeah, I will do that in just a second. For some reason, I'm not seeing. I knew this something would have to go wrong. Um, I'm not seeing the PowerPoint, but here I'll open it up and that should make it easier to find. Um, one second. No Zoom session is, is uh, complete without boring technical glitches. Um, but here, okay, I think I've got it. Um, and um, I'm mostly, mostly this is an occasion to hear Frank talk about his work, but I'll just introduce it because I think um, there are people in the Valley who know Frank and have known Frank for many years and know his work and have been to his shows, but there are a lot of people who don't. And um, talking to people in the Valley over the years, I've always been surprised that um, there were people who didn't realize that we have living here, um, a really major artist whose work has, whose work has um, contributed to the history of abstraction in all kinds of ingenious, playful, fascinating ways. Um, I first met Frank when I was a teenager. My mom took me over to his studio and um, I began ripping him off pretty much the next day. Um, and I have intermittently continued to steal ideas from Frank. And um, visiting his studio every summer is one of the highlights of my summer. And so in some ways, this is an opportunity just to share that experience of Frank's studio, but also to think about Frank's trajectory, his complicated, interesting past that took him from California to Soho in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, up to Keene Valley. Um, and there are more twists and turns than we can possibly hope to get into here, but lots and lots of fascinating, beautiful art um, inventions and discoveries. And so that's, that's what we'll do tonight is that I'll ask a few questions, but Frank, as you know, is a great talker and will mostly guide us through himself. I put this um, PowerPoint together and it doesn't, uh, I wanna emphasize it by no means covers everything, but um, we'll have a little glimpse of the, the early periods of Frank's work and then try to um, cover a little bit more of the 
last few decades. So um, this, this is the kind of image I think people think of. Um, this painting from 2014, Chime, is a pretty typical recent Frank Owen painting. Um, but maybe we'll travel back in time to um, one of Frank's earliest images. And, and I'll start by asking you, Frank, to explain what we're seeing here in this drawing. Oh, we got to unmute you, though. One second. Um, sorry. I'm going to, uh, where do I find Frank? Sorry. Da, 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 da. Um, Okay, Frank, you should now be able to unmute yourself. I. Oh, we. I think we hear you. Frank, are you t are you talking? Frank. So, gotcha. Okay. Now. All right. Now. All right, very good. So this is a very early drawing. Uh, I did it when I was 10 years old. And my mother asked me, Franklin, what are you doing? And I said, Mom, I'm making modern art. <laughs> and so this is indicative of, of my awareness to some extent of, of cubism and early abstraction. And that was a product, I believe, of a childhood habit of reading Life magazine, cover to cover, every week from the age of three on. So, so much so that I almost funked out of freshman year of college when I discovered that the library had bound volumes of all the Life magazines from 1936, which covered more than my life span at that time. And I spent hundreds of hours looking at my past exposures, which was a good visual lesson. Anyhow. It's amazing to think that Life magazine was where Greenberg uh, discovered Pollock to the world. The, yes, is he the, the greatest artist in the world was the title of that article. Yeah. Okay. And what about um, this rather well, different I, image? I was born in Montana, raised in during World War II in Los Angeles. After the war, moved up with my family, my brother, mother, father, to a small farming town in Central Valley, uh, Northern California. And so I enjoyed all the benefits of post-war California booming and hot rod cars and striped uh, bathing suits and uh, <laughs> uh, and I worked in a men's clothing store. This is a 1956 uh, ad copy for the uh, the new bathing suits and that lovely young woman is a uh, year older than us. So wait, this is an actual ad? You were a model? Well, yeah. I was also, by the time I was 17, well, no, I started at 15 and I not only washed the windows at the store, but I did all the window installations. And, and by the time I was 18, I was going to clothing conventions and I had a $20,000 budget to allocate. Wow, that's a story I've never heard. No, no. And then I went off to college at Antioch, Antioch Park, right? Ohio. Yes, and I lasted there about three years and came to New York in 1958 and worked at B. Altman and Company and saw 16 Americans in well, and all that stuff. Famous exhibition. Yeah, but then I left Antioch, came back to California to Sacramento to the State College, met a very passionate and exciting group of young artists. And I'm showing with one of them, a man named Gary Pruner. And then this is one of my shaped canvas paintings. And this is uh, an oil painting, uh, six coats of sanded white lead. Not a very healthy thing to do mm, wow. as an undercoating. Anyhow, but all the stuff leading up to that, we got rid of, we, we challenged each other to throw paintings away. This is the painting on the right side of that previous image, right? Yeah. Is this the yeah. one with the six coats of sanded lead? Six coats of sanded white lead so that it had an immaculately smooth surface. And I took oil paint and sponged it and wiped it on with rags and created this sort of Max Ernst surrealist image. And then I went back and, and, and spent three months with tiny brushes painting a landscape down the lower region and these sort of organic forms colliding with the Renaissance tile floor and so on and so forth. My brother, my brother liked this painting. I didn't know how much until he said to me one day, uh, if, I propose, if I get married to Jane, will you give me that as a wedding present? And I was stuck. <laughs> so he got it. 
Uh, following that, I entered a, a, a phase of doing shape canvases. This was a conceptual piece. I was interested in, in uh, visual perception. Op art was uh, au courant. Um, I was interested also in the idea of tessellation, tiling space, and variability. The idea that this painting could go together if you rotate every one of these hexagons, they bolt together, one sixth of a turn, and then change the relationship to each other. The number of variables here, not to mention a physical configurational change, is a very large number of possibilities. And Frank, I think of these, these paintings with their geometrical mathematical thinking as both connecting to a, an important strand of art thought in that time and also being um, one of the things that you shared with your friend Bruce Nauman, who was, exactly. I remember you, you saying that you guys met because of him seeing work like this. That's right. He saw this painting and one like it and introduced himself to me. And then our friendship began then. Uh, this is another one of those. And, and this goes to get, again, they can go together a very large number of ways. Bill Reed and I were talking about this just a week ago, this whole idea. And then the next phase was a, a kind of color field, pointillist paintings with grids, and they were made with rollers. So if we go to the next slide, and that's a close up detail shot of the painting. And if you go to the next one, that's that painting on a, stretched on a table, face up, plywood table, and I'm in my studio in Sacramento, that governor, re-elect Governor Brown is not Jerry Brown, it's- uh, His father. His father. Wow, and, yeah. And I had a wonderful studio, no, no perimeter windows, but a 12 foot square skylight right in the middle of the room. And that's you in the orange t-shirt, right? No. No? That's a young, art, the fellow sitting down is a uh, artist, poet, writer, who's a uh, student in my advanced drawing class. They hired me as a graduate student to teach a drawing, advanced drawing class and uh, the next semester an advanced painting class, which was a big boost up for me. But I had this wonderful studio. And over on the left, you'll see some digital, digitally produced graphics, which uh, another friend of mine was a mathematician. And we devised these things that we could get on the printer at the UC, Cal UC Davis, California Computer Center at three in the morning. And it would take two hours to print out one of these things. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's a theme for that goes through your later work, early graphics programs you were using in the 80s that helped produce some of the work we'll see in a little while. That's quite true. Then, uh, after I finished graduate school at age 28, it took me nine years to get a bachelor's, <laughs> uh, one of my professors that Alexi has written about, Richard Archwager, said, you ought to come to New York. And so did all the faculty at Davis, because they were all artists who were belonged to various movements called funk art or nut art later on. And uh, so Martha Lee and I had both worked there, as I said earlier, and we came and we gave some money to a well-known eccentric guy named George Matchunas, who founded an art movement called Fluxus. And he swindled us in effect, took our money and gave it to various contractors that he had debts with. And then we had to go to court and uh, so we lost a lot of our money in paying the lawyer who happened to be Jackie Kennedy's lawyer. A little expensive wow. for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So I didn't, didn't make any art for a year. Uh, I worked as a floor layer, a sheetrock hanger, and an art mover. Uh, and we slept on the floors of three different friends who had lofts in various parts of the neighborhood. And we've but moved three times a week. right, Frank? Yeah. When you came? Summer, yeah. Well, we came here summer of 68 and stayed actually till the spring of 69. Stayed through that winter because of the mass unit swindle thing. Mm -hmm. So we, and we rented an apartment in Austin Crawford's store, which we now own and live in. And there was one upstairs that used to be a, a pool room. And at one time it was a county, a branch of the county jail. And Adrian, my father-in-law, had made it into a four-room apartment. We rented that for $50 a month. And uh, So wait, you were in New York for a year and then up in King Valley for a period, for a short well, period? Or? Yeah, we, yeah the, that summer, that year of, of, we didn't get into a loft, this loft, until 69. This is looking down toward the corner of Canal Street and Broadway. Yeah. 
And this is the inside looking out to that fire escape. And I tried to make those dot paintings, but I couldn't get any excitement about them. And one evening, I'm messing around with acrylic paint, and I must add that I'm a child of the acrylic area, era, era, a remarkable invention product-wise for artists, so a fast drying, uh, physically responsive. You could buy it in quart and gallon quantities, and a uh, remarkable invention and a great influence on my work. And I discovered that if I thinned it down with water to the consistency of heavy cream and mix it like you would create batter for a chocolate cake where you stir the white stuff into the brown stuff or vice versa. And most people just continue to stir like the recipe says, but I didn't. I only did it part way and then I poured it. And next one. There's the color. I would spend two, two weeks mixing these nine ounce styrofoam cups of color in anticipation of the painting. And, and this one, I think had 250 cups. And every evening before bed, I would go out with a sprinkler and, and put a quarter inch of water on the top. <laughs> so yeah, because otherwise it dries so fast, it would have been yeah. all, all been dead, yeah. And then the next one. So that's a close up of the painting. These things were done on canvas stretched on a, on a wooden, a plywood platform. Uh, and I had a painter, painter's fingerboard, which is a, uh, uh, you'll see one later in an image coming up, uh, that I could dance out across. And I was 30 years old, 31, and agile, and didn't weigh anything like I do now. And, uh, and pretty supple. And so I could go out there and pour these liquids into each other. You, if you are at, at all attentive to the bladder you get on Facebook, there's a lot of art being poured nowadays. Mm -hmm. But I, so I get to claim it early, but then Jackson Pollock poured paint. Right. And you were kind of taking further the, the poor, poured idea and um, complicating it physically in a way well, that I, nobody had. I was looking at the, at the older generation of painters, Jules Olitsky and, and of course Pollock. I was called a second rate Pollock in a German, <laughs> by a German art critic. Uh, and that's the finished painting. Done in one day, had to be done in a day. Had to prep for it for two weeks and clear the calendar, no phone calls, and learn <laughs> to take two minute naps. And uh, so that probably took, oh, 20 hours. Of pouring. Of continuous working. Yeah. And dancing out over the painting, that's eight feet tall, so. And yeah. here's a couple of them. Is this from the Castelli show? Yeah, I was taken on uh, as Alexi will attest by a quite notable dealer named Leo Castelli. The, uh, the central dealer of the 60s and 70s, the, the guy. Yeah, he, he introduced uh, Robert Rauschenberg's work, Jasper John's work, Andy Warhol's work, uh, the minimalists, pop art, Rick Lichtenstein, Rosenquist, and this was his gallery. I was, he had opened one in, on West Broadway in Soho, and I was offered a choice between the new gallery on, on West Broadway, 420 West Broadway, or the 4 East 77th Street original gallery, which is not a very big room. This wall to the left is uh, about 20 feet wide at most, and it was a living room of, of a Brown, uh, brownstone. In, in any event, I said, I want to show my paintings in that space where pop art was introduced, where minimal art was introduced, where everybody showed. I wanted to see my paintings there. So this is an installation shot of that show. And the next two images are these two paintings uh, in my studio after their completion. This one is cur currently owned by the Springfield, Missouri uh, Art Museum, and it has the distinction of being the painting that the visitors take the most selfies with. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, would have been 72 or so? Or what was it? And this is the other painting mm -hmm. that's uh, in the Madison Art Center or Museum of Contemporary Art in Madison, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Gaudy things, aren't they? And then this is a painting titled Macaw, 
It's one of my faves. Uh, mine, by this time, I am not only pouring with, out of vessels with a spout, but I'm also doing things on big sheets of sheet metal. I had sheet metal trays fabricated for myself so I could lay out pools of black paint. This, this painting might have taken 20 gallons of, of thinned down paint. Uh, so but the sheet metal was to pour from so that you could get a certain effect? I could lay out of... big passages. If you, if you look at this, you'll see movements. And then I would pour pours on top of the pour, on top of a base black color in this case, and then lay it out. And then I would lay things on top of it. So fairly athletic way of working. Yeah. And then things changed, right? There was a, there's a, then, I feel like come to I, a pivot point. I showed, I had two shows with Castelli, but I also, I also, well, two shows, uh, wonderful man, very elegant, thoughtful, uh, kind, considerate, and he paid stipends to his artists, which meant that everybody in the gallery who showed with him, whether they sold or not, got $500 a month, which in those days paid the rent and bought all the food you needed. Um, but I realized that he was not exhibiting much interest in what I was doing and that I needed to change my work in any event because it seemed too reliant upon that kind of wonderful bunch of techniques I had, but I wanted to make something different. And I was interested particularly by the idea of the field painting. Someone once said, and I wish I remembered the quote exactly, that nothing is more beautiful than a, an array of disparate items unlike each other. And I thought that's what a painting could be like if you could in include all kinds of forms and different kinds of languages. So the next slide, this is a close up of this painting. Uh, and I wanted, I was looking at the cloud chamber images, physics uh, explosions and, and uh, on, you know, ultra tiny scales, but these arcs that slice and dice through space and, and layers of information. And I was trying to find a way of working, um, uh, a technique that opened it up for me that I could explore those notions of encompassing and inclusiveness and open-ended ex exploration of, of space and marks and images, images and objects and so on and so forth. And I did this one just building from the front in a conventional way with, with white paint and paste out of acrylic paint. So we're objects oh. like the knife we see in this previous image. Well, this is how I got into my change. I, I, my wife, Martha Lee, felt somewhat endangered by my fascination with the form of with knives flying through space. But I thought, why not? And, and I think that knives are so elegant and most people have don't, don't have favorite forks, but they do have favorite knives. And, and I was thinking about what simple kinds of technologies did early human beings devise for themselves and cutters and mashers and binders. So you had rocks to smash things, knives or pieces of shell or sharpened stone to cut things and vines to make binding knots to pull things together. And so th those became my form and image language. Uh, this for people who are out, not connected to the art world, this is all so much a part of the way people were thinking about verbs and verbless and process in that time. And to me, it's a great, it feels so of its period and yet totally distinctive at the same time. Well, what I was doing was I was collecting knives of different types and burying them halfway uh, in, beds of plasticine clay and then I would make rubber latex molds of the array of knives um, and then I would fill them with acrylic paint and peel them out and then I could glue them into the paint. So it was a one kind day, of relief sculpture at the same time. Yeah and then but one day a friend of mine Arthur Shade came at me and says Frank why don't you just make your paintings in the clay which is what I did. I bought 350 pounds of Plastilina, which is an oil-based sculptor's clay, and usually most of us as kids remember it as an olive green. And uh, but in this case, it was ivory colored. 
from Sculpture House in Manhattan. And I cut it into half inch three, or five eighths inch slabs, put hardware cloth down on a plywood table where I used to stretch my paintings for pouring, pounded out the clay, and then began to engrave it and incise it and press things into it, including a life-size uh, photo engraving on magnesium of me standing on the right. You saw that some of you might have seen this last summer down at Keen Arts, or two summers ago, I take that back. It's a beautiful big painting. It was so fantastic to see it there. And the image that I worked with in this one is this sort of explosive moment, like a, like a, a, a spark chamber event. And uh, there's a list of words there that are all crimes and misdemeanors. The title of the painting is I Might. I might do this, I might do that, I might do this, I might do some other things, on and on and on. It's all about potentiality. Ah. Another pivot. The week before that painting was exhibited in the spring of 1981, week before specifically April 25th, I was coming back from having taught the spring semester as a visiting artist at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. And a graduate student and I, and the, the paintings, including that big one we just saw uh, in a 17-foot U-Haul, came back from Richmond, pulled in in front of my gallery where I was to unload all these paintings for the show that was to open a week later. My first show with her, by the way. Uh, with Nancy Hoffman, this is. Nancy Hoffman. But she's somebody I've known since 1971. <laughs> uh, and she had a long face on her when she came to greet us and said, Frank, I've got bad news. And I says, well, the announcement card didn't get printed. No. It got printed, I said, maybe. And the image is upside down. That, that's perilous for an abstract painter. <laughs> and, and then, no, she says, your loft is on fire, present tense. But we, because we had a parking place in front of the gallery and I was only four and a half blocks away, we walked rapidly to the fire and up the stairs where the water was roaring down and mm. hoses and firemen. And, and, uh, and who else was there? Well, Prissy Reed greeted us when we came into the loft and she had taken charge in the way that Prissy can. And the firemen were ready to hose everything in the place down because that's what they like to do. And she stopped them and gave them good bossy direct orders in a loud voice. Don't spray that and protect that. And there's the fire. Don't do that. And saving by virtue of that, yes, our books and collectibles were smoke damaged, but they weren't blown apart. But these are the the uh, some of the paintings that burned up. This one is that painting macaw that I showed you earlier. Oh wow! Yeah. So I we lo I lost many many paintings. Drawings, the poor paintings. Drawings. Yeah. Yeah. And a month of cleaning up the loft and moving up here to Keene Valley, where we were going to summer anyhow. Uh, I was able to, through Mark Lee's good offices, rent the building that I now own and I'm talking from, uh, the top floor of Pete Bigelow's storage barn. And I built a clay table and here it is. And so I, what you're looking at is a clay table that is, I've incised all these marks, these arcs and template forms and whatnot. And then I'm painting it front to back in verso. Mm. And I'd layer and layer things up, and then I'd, there'd be a, a binding series of layers across the entirety of the surface. And then canvas would be glued on, and the thing would be pulled out of what is effectively a mold. This is what it looks like for me to be working. And that thing that I'm kneeling on is the aforementioned painter's fingerboard. It's on wheels, and I spent... <sighs> The years I poured paint, the years I engraved paint, out over that, on my knees, getting up 200 times a day, getting back down 200 times a day. That's why I have two artificial knees. My <laughs> shoulders are shot. I've had a hip replacement. Ah. But what but I'm doing you had, here, a, you had a completely physically distinctive way of making a painting. You had what, in a way, everybody dreams of, a process that was entirely your own like nobody else's, and yet that was connected to relief sculpture, to intaglio printmaking, 
and it was, of course, above all, a kind of a new way of painting. Yeah, very close. Yeah. So this, these are some examples of it. Uh, I, this, this painting's out in California. Uh, these are the paintings I first saw, or this period of painting when I was a kid and first came to your studio and was blown away. Now, if you look on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a, a, a form there. And go back, Alexi, can you? And you'll see it in the right lower right-hand corner of this white painting. So I could and did on occasion use some of the earlier existing surfaces, and then I would use and cut back into it even more and augment it and, and, and build on it. So I could use, like a printmaking thing, I could do two or three versions sometimes off of that surface. But then, of course, I had to smooth it all out. I had to pound to play start back into all the grooves I'd cut, and then I had to get on my knees on that painter's fingerboard and scrape. So my, my shoulder surgeon asked me, not well, a few years back before I began to operate, he says, what were you, a concrete finisher? <laughs> because of all this scraping. Yeah. Okay, you can move on there. So there's another one. And these, and it's, it's hard looking at the images here um, flat to get a real sense of, how, of the, phys the beauty of the physical relief, of the precision of each of these little tiny um, lines that come off the surface. But have, it's in person, they're so, it's such a beautiful effect. The sense that your eye has of light bouncing off of the tiny crevices at the perimeter of each form. Well, and some of these lines might be, you know, half inch, three quarters of an inch. Off the surface. Then, then you mentioned earlier, early computer stuff, the, like this black zigzagged edge form. Oh, yeah. Uh, was generated on Martha Lee's uh, early computer, which, which had a 10 megabyte hard drive and, and uh, had a graphics program. And so I would scribble with the mouse. I'd make a scribbly mark and it would be, of course, a series of stacked squares or rectangles, kind of going from large to small or going across. Then I would take those and print them, maybe on overhead transparency, photocopy them. Uh, or cut small versions out, and then I'd put them on an overhead projector in the studio and blow them up at an angle so they had perspectival quality. Yeah. And that's what that black form is. So I had the studio wall, as you remember, Alexi was covered with hundreds of templates. So beautiful, these cardboard zigzaggy t shapes all over the walls. And I and and you have the feeling templates. it was you like a templates. kind of Cartesian version of abstract expressionism. Yeah, but you make templates. I, an idea that's partly, as I say, stolen from um, Franklin C. Owen. But it's exhausting to cut them, isn't it? A lot of finger cutting. A lot of pressure, down pressure. That wears your shoulders out, Alexi. Mm, I, yeah. My cutting's easier than yours. Well, anyhow, this one's, yeah, this one's a very dense surfaces. I, th this is an image not from Frank, but that I took um, at Keen Arts. Uh, was it a couple summers ago? Just because I yeah. wanted to show the uh, relief a little bit closer. It's a detail. Yeah. This is a series. Sorry about the blurry faded look of the. This is a, a series called The Coppers. And I made 140 paintings, different sizes, uh, and angled, shaped bits and pieces, all different kinds of motifs, some that I'd use. This is me on down on the lower right. I'm on the floor cleaning one of these paintings. I'm picking the clay off. And that's what happened when you peel it out of the clay. You have to scrub it for, it takes a day of, with uh, mineral spirits and scrub brushes and little wooden toothpicks and oh boy. And then I, the middle one is two people. That's myself and a graduate student uh, having a conference. Again, about including anything I wanted that could be in there. There's language, there's all sorts of stuff. It's hard to see at first. I, I don't know if everyone sees this. It's in silhouette, that lower right hand figure of yourself working on the floor. Does my mouse show? No. This is a piece using that same kind of idea of the white spots, of course, are the open wall. 
And this is a 25 foot wide by uh, eight and a half feet high piece. Uh, I think it's uh, 17 panels. And I did this because I wasn't teaching in the year, what was it, 1989, when Governor Mario, then Governor Mario Cuomo, uh, announced the creation of the 21st Century Commission on the Adirondacks. And uh, they met and issued a, uh, a set of concepts about how the APA Act should be modified, more constitutional amendments made to protect the park. And there was quite a bit of uproar, uh, not just similar to the kind of political divisions we are experiencing at this point in time. Um, and I was not teaching, and, but I was interested. And so I decided to cover it and be kind of a, be sort of a visual journalist. So I went to everybody's protest march, meeting from the middle of the rotors, to the extreme conservationists, to the ultra againsters. Uh, and I attended and brought my camera and I photographed everybody. And there's one place where they all coexisted and that's that panel in the upper right down along the bottom edge. And all the rebels and the rousers and the ultra this and that, are, they're all in the same space there. They're cohabiting the painting. And down in the, the to the cent, right of center lower thing is, is an image of uh, three versions of the head of Mario Cuomo, different sizes, small to large. And halfway up is one of Nelson Rockefeller, because he was the originator of the APA Act. And I got to, this, sh this painting was in a 1992, Park Centennial Exhibition at the Museum of Blue Mountain Lake. And it was the last piece in the show, occupied this big wall. And it's a socio-political landscape of that historic moment. And I got to interpret it, more or less, to Governor Cuomo. And he wondered about the different sized heads. Why am I there three times, different sizes? And I says, Governor, it's too soon to tell how large you're gonna be. <laughs> To me, it's such a great example of the way that abstraction, which had been such a narrow, pure, ideological kind of idiom in the 50s and 60s, had gradually, thanks to you and, and other people, could expand and become more inclusive and could incorporate things that the early, you know, the Greenberg thought it could never incorporate. Well, I have to say that I've always admired Robert Rauschenberg and the way he came up with a pre-pop art idea of, you know, newspaper images, magazines, photography, all blending together in these fields of, of information. And this is the other side. Yeah. And um, there's, there's, I think of there being a period here where you were really, in oblique ways, you were kind of talking about where you were be, here in the Adirondacks in a way that you hadn't done so much earlier on. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the name of the, the title of the piece be, that we looked at, the big one, is Floor of the Forest. Uh, my metaphor is uh, all the detritus and the things that fall on the, on the forest floor in a span of time. Mm -hmm. the, the rich complexity. The, in those days, I didn't drive to my studio. I parked on Adirondack Street and walked in on a little pathway. And I was constantly picking things up like stones and leaves. And I had learned in the early 80s a technique for making photocopies. And because I was now at this point, I'm, I'm painting no longer on clay. I'm painting on sheets of industrial polyethylene or polypropylene that are on that same table and I'm working again in verso from front to back and I'm putting down clear gel coats and I'm gluing in photocopies like there's a plant form in the, in the middle of this one and plants on the left and stones and twigs and all this detritus of, of, of the forest uh, is represented photocopically and I could glue them in face down with clear acrylic gel and then when it was dry, I could wash the paper away and back paint it. And so that's what 
is happening in this piece. And that technique is, it was quite important to me for a long time after this. And what similar, this similar painting? here, right? Similar here, yes. This painting is titled Students and Teachers. Cairns, Cairns, Students and Teachers. I did a series of, of paintings that were about stacking items and images like we stack stones. In this case, it's faculty and students of a <clears throat> prep school, shall not be mentioned, uh, <laughs> plus lengths of, of, of wood and stones and the paint you see that's all flecky, uh, I, that's a chopped paint. Take dried acrylic paint, put it in the blender. <laughs> Some water and it, it's ground up. And it's a sort of acrylic terrazzo. Yeah, exactly. And here's one with uh, relief stones around the frame pounded into clay and then mounted on wood. And then these are all picked up, gathered rocks from the, around the studio building, uh, photocopied or photographed and photocopied, and then put into this painting. And down below, uh, at the bottom of it, you'll see one of those copper paintings, the one that you saw earlier. But some of these are 3D reliefs, aren't they? Or it's, are they all 2D? Uh, are, yes, yes. This one was made on the clay. So the stones, it alternates with, with photographic images and, thing, and things that protrude. Yeah. And there, to me, there was a beautiful philosophical intuition lurking in it about the idea of a stone being the kind of ultimate obdurate material fact. Yes. And then the playfulness of you saying, look, I can, do, I can do all kinds of things with these ostensibly simple facts. Yeah, and I'm not done yet with this. I've, I've got a new idea. It's beautiful. And this is another one with the kind of relief frame around relief a two-dimensional painting. And then, and then the, the surface of the painting is as, is as smooth as glass. And it's very much how I'm working now. This is one of those paintings that's very smooth on the surface. It's part of a series called uh, uh, Between Seasons. I determined that the most attractive season to me is mud week, mud season. Uh, I miss it dearly because things are, you can see through the trees, the light is sparkling. Uh, you have new things coming up and old things there. And, and uh, so it's, it's wonderful. So I made about five paintings on that idea. I love this group. I love their schmeeriness, the kind of, they're simultaneously elegant and kind of, as, this, as the title implies, at the same time, kind of like schmutz and schmear and mess. Well, remember, I'm working from the back. I mean, I'm working from the front to the back. So some of these items go on very early and then I back them with the schmutz and the scrabble and the scribble and the, so on. Similar with this one. But a whole different palette here. This is, to me, this is maybe the start of the last kind of decade and a half where you've been, uh, where the, you, there's a sort of, like the ghost of Hans Hoffman is a little bit present in these, no? That's a good point, yeah, yeah. Now, some of these things are glued on the front, like these grid marks and whatnot. I can cast the paint grids uh, in uh, sheets of, uh, thicker high density polyethylene that have been run through the table saw to make a grid like this one in the middle there and fill it with acrylic paint and peel it out. And this is a one of three that I'm going to show you, but it probably six paintings that as my dealer Nancy Hoffman said, Frank, you could just do these the rest of your life. Uh, what I do a lot of is pre-manufactured forms, uh, paint forms uh, on sheets of polyethylene or poly-coated craft paper. And that means I can make a spill, a dribble, a scrape of blue, black, uh, and separately and build it up, back paint it, do things with it, peel it off and glue it in to the painting. So like the figure eight, like Lariat that we're seeing on the right hand side, that would be an example, right? Well, I might have painted that one in the beginning. Oh, so it I might have done that one in the beginning. That's right up front. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of those that are like cut uh, over, um, elliptical forms and whatnot, those are those are 
pre-made offside and then cut with an elliptical template mm -hmm. and then glued in. Uh, so it's a collage process. Collage, yeah. And then I can also brush paint into it. And these were called fretters. I, my dealer had, I don't know, I got interested in, I'd met Dale Chilhuli. Uh, the glass the blower sculptor. And, and spent some time in his company and got interested in the hot glass movement and thought, what could I make in the way of paintings that would kind of compete a little bit? And uh, so I made all these elements and parts and, and I'm still doing that. I'm still making parts. I have all these baking, uh, bakery tray muffin racks in here and they're all stacked with sheets of paint that I can use. I, I love that part of your studio, seeing all the ways that you recycle ordinary objects and, you know, kitchen tools and hardware tools to turn them into paint delivery devices. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun inventing stuff. I, I'm a tool and die maker on some level. This painting is about seven by seven feet. This one's bigger. This is 115 inches high by 120 wide. I'm physically unable to make anything like that. But what I'm working on now, and we're heading towards conclusion, are just one standard size, 50 by 40 inches. And this is one wall of my show in fall of 2018 at the Lake George uh, Arts uh, Program. And these, these are from that show? I can't remember. It's not on that show. It's not on that wall. It's on the opposite wall. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm using scraping tools, cutting through slow drying acrylic paint. And then back painting. Mm -hmm. And I'm pre-manufacturing striped elements, uh, striped elements. So something like that red from lower left to upper right and back down again is something I made off side and then I glued it in and folded it. You call them skins sometimes, right? Skins, yes, paint skins, acrylic paint skins. I think I have some studio shots that will show. Oh, wait, yeah. here's, here's one that shows one of your tools. It's a scraping makes... tool, mm -hmm. and it's also made out of, uh, mounted on a, a quarter inch rubber thing, so it's flexes. So it is not, doesn't have to always be straight. It can bend and it becomes circular and wavy. But you cut out all those shapes to make, sure. yeah. That, you know, that, that's just door strip molding. Weather. Customized uh, to become a kind of a brush. Oh, Key Valley, Valley Hardware, McDonough's Valley Hardware is a central factor of my creative life. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how some of these parallel swooshing lines are made by tools like that. Yes, indeed. And this as well. Yeah. And this, I think, is our last slide. Our last slide. It's one Gala. that I especially love, Gala. And it's a perfect title for it, too. But Frank, we as viewers can't always tell what is an improvisation in the, in the surface and what is a skin, right? Well, the, the surface of these is all uniform. It's all smooth. Right. But in other words, like that kind of cream brown colored ideograph at the bottom, that could be a skin or that could be something you that, did on uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I can, I will, I will do is I, I'm doing these on the, on the polyethylene sheets from the front to the back, verso. Mm -hmm. So I can work, I can squirt out a transparent color like that form down the lower right, and then back paint it. I get very meticulous sometimes. So it's like coloring it. What fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then others are transparent, translucent skins. The Some are made of scraping uh, paint over uh, polyethylene, poly-coated uh, craft paper placed on top of folded paper. And it picks up the impression of the folded increased sheets. Yeah, I love that. So there's no reason for me ever not to be doing something every day. 
and you've talked a little bit about the kind of garish, highly saturated color in this recent work as being something that interests you in, in its, the spirit of its kind of over the top intensity. Yeah. Can I talk about that, you mean? Be well, careful. I might, yeah. might, well, I might make a very subtle one. I mean, my purpose, my, my charge to myself in this body of work I'm working on now, all the same size, 50 by 40, is to just try to drain myself of everything I can do or think to do. Mm. And I hope that I won't be able to. I keep having new ideas and I want to exhaust the viewer if I ever have an exhibition, you know, looking at 30 things that are all different but related will just wear you out, won't it? That's yeah. a beautiful ambition. Yeah. I, think, I think we can stop or at least pause on that note. I think, um, don't you have one? Oh, there you go. The, this is this is an image from the um, interview that you and I did five years ago for the Brooklyn Rail, a uh, uh, mag arts magazine that's kind of influential among New York uh, artists. And if people are interested in hearing more details, uh, reading more details, they can look at it's available online. I very much appreciate this drawing because he got rid of all my blemishes. <laughs> um, but I think we'll end it there and we'll have, I think, I think maybe uh, David will take over again and then we'll have a little question period. Is that right? Right. Yep. So um, bear with me a, um, a minute while I um, change a few settings here. Boy, I look pretty serene, don't I? <laughs> this is like, remember how you got that art one assignment to render an egg? Draw an egg, that was always a good beginning art class. That's what that, you know. That's Fong okay. Bui, who's the editor and publisher of The Rail, who did that drawing of you. Still wearing those glasses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask to look. Look like people to um, keep themselves on mute until they want to answer, uh, ask a question and then put themselves back on mute again in order to reduce background noise. And hopefully it will work well this week. Um, but maybe I'll turn it over to Karen Glass first and see if she has anything to add. Um, no, I will just, if people raise their hand, um, I will call on them I, or just say something. Just, it's very hard on Zoom if everybody talks at once. So just sort of like call out a question or raise your hand. Well, I see Malcolm McDougall already raising his Hi, hand. Malcolm. Yeah. I can't keep quiet. I can't keep, keep quiet for too long. Go Hello on. there, gentlemen. Thank you nice. very much, Alexi, and thank you, Karen and, and Frank, for doing this. Um, I, I'm glad I got a chance to say, say that because I'm, I'm just going to now have to sign off because dinner's on the table ah. and our daughter's just come back. But that was uh, really, really interesting, Frank. I mean, I know you're interesting, but that was very particularly interesting. Alexi, you brought out the best in him. That was, it was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really wonderful program, and thank you, Karen, for making that, that happen. So I'll catch thank up with you guys. Thank you, for Keen Arts, for um, having so many, so many great images that you have shown over there, including the, some of the pictures of Frank's that we talked about earlier. Frank can show anything he wants, anytime he wants at, at, at Keen Arts. He knows that. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thank you so, so much. I, I hate thank to sign you. off, but I'm... The dinner's getting a little, uh, little cool over here. Happy birthday, Nash. And thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Goodbye. Bye now. I think there are plenty of other people who are about to have dinner, myself included, so we may not have a whole lot of questions, but That's if there's right. one or two, we could certainly, do, certainly um, entertain sure, them. Sure, I'll ask one. Ed. Go ahead, Nash. So, so, Frank, I mean, you... You uh, sort of alluded in a lot of different ways, um, but really, you know, how you know how important has the Adirondacks being here been to you, and um, in your work, and um, this, yeah, it's been very important. I, um, I mean, I always had a well, not always. I my connection dates from 1959 when I came here from Antioch College as a camp counselor at Baldwin School Camp and, and uh, aid, assisted the late Pat Kermer uh, teach arts and crafts at, at that school camp. And I was there two summers and I met my future wife and father-in-law and mother-in-law. Uh, 
some of the community members, but, uh, and then we came back again, starting in 68, and uh, a somewhat forcible move, move here in, in, that, in that period. After the fire. After the fire. But I was able to get this wonderful studio space and, and renovate it and build myself in. And I've had a great good time here. And uh, I feel it's a, it's a marvelous. It's been a great experience. I, uh, the community, the people in it, the artists, the changing population of people, the increasing number in the arts community as far as, wouldn't you think that's the case, Nash? Yeah, yeah, it uh, is. It is. It's like a new renaissance. You think back in the 19th century when there's so many artists and there's a, and there's a nice diversity of, you know, ra you know, writers like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Russell Banks and so many others. But uh, I remember when Robin Pell gave his one of his lectures on art in the valley, and he quoted somebody as having counted, what, 40 or 50 easels out in the fields, right. painting the landscape. And I remember having, because I knew Harold Weston, Harold and Faith Weston, and Harold said to me very sternly, please don't let this become a damned art colony. Because <laughs> he was against all that. He didn't want that, you know, fancy schmancy in a art colony. It should be made of, you know, sterner stuff. But, but it isn't the traditional kind of art colony, I don't think. But now, of course, I know this town better than my hometown. I mean, yeah. I can walk Norton Cemetery and know a great number of the names on the headstones and remember them mainly. Yeah, uh, it's been great. And also, I think, Frank, your work has changed the, you know, what Adirondack art can mean. I feel like there was, for a long time, there's still been what Weston was complaining about, a kind of sentimental pastoral landscape ideal and the, one of the beautiful things about works like Between the Seasons to me is that it shows a, a totally different way of dealing with what landscape means for painting. Well, that's, that's nice of you to say. I mean, I was trying to find my points of contact with that subject matter, but it had, you know, being the local abstract painter, I had to do something. <laughs> you know, it's a job somebody's got to do. There was Rye also who introduced, who also brought abstract, a different kind, but also brought abstract here. And Monica Bradbury, I think. So oh, yeah. You, you oh, sort yeah. of uh, led the way there, but there were others who followed. Well, there's many others. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. David Smith really, and uh, George O'Keefe really brought, you know, I mean, they were incredible, what they did down in Lake George and Bolton. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, should we leave it there? Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Frank. Thank yeah. you, Alexi. Thanks for coming. Frank, it's always oh, a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. This was. Good stuff. Thank you, Alexi. Thank you, thank you Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Alexi. Thank you, David. Jerry. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Goodbye, Bye. everybody. Good night. Bye. Thank you. That was so fun. Thank you very much.